and make yourself comfortable. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. To the Honorable Dr. Tri Lasmi Indraswari SHM Hum, Vice Dean for Academic and Student Affairs Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro. To the Honorable Visiting Lecturer, Dr. Sia Chin Chin, from the Faculty of Business and Law, Taylor's Law School, Taylor's University, Malaysia. A very warm welcome we bid to all of the participants and students of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro. I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude for your presence at this memorable occasion. It is indeed a pleasure to have you all today. We thank God for his blessings so that this morning we could gather here in this general lecture regarding we are what we eat, why law matters. Before we begin, please allow me to read the agenda of the session this afternoon, uh, this morning, sorry. Firstly, the lecture will be open and guided by the moderator, Ms. Anggita Dora Mia Lumban Raja SHMH. Second, we will hear a welcoming speech from Dr. Tri Lasmi Indraswari SHM Hum, our Vice Dean for Academic and Student Affairs for Faculty of Law Universitas Diponegoro. And third, the presentation will be delivered by the guest lecturer, Dr. Sia Chin Chin, from the Faculty of uh, Business and Law, Taylor's Law School, Taylor's University, Malaysia. And thirdly, and finally, the last session. At the end of this session, there is question and answers session and also a brief photo session before we close all the uh, all the agenda and now ladies and gentlemen before we start the session i would like to introduce our moderator first based on her curriculum vitae please allow me to introduce the moderator her name is angita doramia lumban raja shmh she is born in lampung august 18 1991 with her educational qualifications are as follows. She attained her bachelor degree in the Faculty of Law Universitas Diponegoro, and she also attained her master's degree in the Faculty of Law Universitas Diponegoro. Her current occupation is the Assistant Professor of Law in Faculty of Law Universitas Diponegoro. Without further ado, let me call Ms. Angita. Ms. Angita, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Resti, as our star of ceremony for today. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before we start our guest uh, general lecture, uh, first, uh, firstly, please allow me to uh, welcome our first uh, vice dean for academic and students affair, Dr. Tri Laksmi, that will give us welcoming speech for our guest honor guest lecture. Dr. Trick Lesmi, the time is yours. Yeah, okay. To the Honorable Dr. Xia Chin from School Business of Law, Taylor University, Malaysia. All participants, good morning. First of all, thanks to Allah SWT who has been given us blessing so we can join the visiting lecture today in a good condition. On behalf of Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro, I deeply honor to welcome Dr. Shia Tintin from School Business of Law, Taylor University, Malaysia. Welcome, Doctor, even in virtual due to COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude for Dr. Shia Tintin for accepting our invitation to join the visiting lecture program this year. Visiting lectures topic is what are what we eat well or matters. So that's interesting topic, doctor. We do hope the visiting lecture can improve our student knowledge and also give mutual beneficial in our education. We do hope the collaboration between Taylor University, uh, Malaysia, and Faculty of Law Universitas Diponegoro will continue, not only for short term relationship, but also in long-term relationship. For all participants, thank you for joining the visiting lecture today and enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tri Laksmi, for your speech. OK, uh, thank, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning for the Honorable Distinguished Guest Lecturer, Dr. Sia Chin Chin from Taylor's University. And good morning to fellow students and all of the participants who are joining this Zoom meeting and also watching live streaming on YouTube. 
My name is Angita Doramia Lumban Raja. I am Assistant Professor of Law in the Faculty of Law, Universitas Stiporogoro. It is my pleasure to be a moderator for this general lecture. First of all, I would like to welcome all of you this, to this general lecture about we are what we eat, why law matters. I am so excited to have you here, excited about all of the informative uh, conversations that we are going to discuss today. Uh, because this is our first time in our campus to have discussion about food law. Most of us are dealing with obesity, malnutrition, or perhaps allergies to several ingredients items in food. We are less informed regarding food, what we eat, like the details of the nutrition facts, etc. Especially for the kids. For them, as long as the taste is good, the kids will consume it without thinking twice. Have we ever think that what we ate in childhood will have an impact on our health when we are going older. Our guest lecturer will give the detailed information regarding the role of law and regulation on these matters. She will give us the information that we have never gotten before. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start the general lecture, and in order to avoid any disturbances during the presentation later, I would like to ask you to mute your microphone. So please notice your microphone button on the mute mode. And there are several pieces of information that I would like to give to you before we start the lecture. First, this general lecture will take a time from 9 until 11 a.m. in Semarang time or 10 until 12 a.m. in Selang in slanger time. So our guest lecturer will deliver her lecture maximum in 45 minutes and will be followed by question and answer session. For information, this lecture is recorded and also live streaming on YouTube channel. Second, the participants are allowed to write down their questions in chat column. Please ask your questions briefly and clearly with the appropriate words. And don't forget, please make sure your questions are relevant with the topic of this general lecture regarding food law. Also, we welcome your opinions and arguments on several issues related with the food law. Third, the question and answer session will be opened by moderator right after our, our guest lecturer finishes her presentations. In this question and answer session, the moderator will choose several questions from the chat column and will read them for the guest lecturer. Ladies and gentlemen, before the presentation begins, please allow me to introduce to you our guest lecturer for today. Her name is Dr. Sia Chintin. She is a senior lecturer at Taylor's University, Malaysia. Her educational and qualifications are as follows. In 2002, she graduated with her bachelor degree from the University of Sheffield, England, United Kingdom. In 2003, she got her postgraduate diploma in bar vocational studies in Cardiff University, Wales, in the United Kingdom. In 2008, she graduated with her master's degree in law and economics from Université Paul Sejong et Marseille 3, France, Université Jean Belgium, Université de Bologna, Italy. In, in 2020, she got her philosophy of doctor in public health food law on the new labeling from Taylor University in Malaysia. Dr. Shi Chinchin joined Taylor University in 2015. Her principal fields of expertise include commercial law, public health, and food law, lifelong legal education, international law, and economic analysis of law. She is supervising postgraduate and undergraduate students and is currently working on research of commercial law, legal education, and health and food policies. Prior to joining Taylor's University, she has extensive experience of more than 10 years in legal consultation. She was a program and contract administrator in the Scientific Research Funding Department, Saudi Arabia, legal counsel in an additional firm in Milan, in charge of international commercial consultation and non-managing partner in a Malaysia legal firm. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to welcome our guest lecturer to begin the presentation. Dr. Xia Chinchin, the screen is yours. Very uh, good morning to everyone here. Thank you very much to our Dean, Dr. Trace Lakshmi, as well as uh, our colleague here from Indonesia, Mrs. Angita, and all the uh, students here who are currently present. I know it's not easy to wake up at nine o'clock I know how you feel. I know exactly 
how you are going through. And I really appreciate all your time in waking up this early to join us this morning. Thank you very much. And it's my pleasure to be here with you, to all the faculty and also the students here in this prestigious university in Indonesia in Samara. So I'll start sharing my screen now of the slides that I'm gonna present today. So Mrs. Angita, I'm given 45 minutes, correct? Can yes. you please confirm? Yeah, yes. okay, thank you very much. Okay, all right. So this is not uh, the first one, but you can already see where I'm going to talk about. All right, so if the screen is visible to everyone, I will start now, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for confirming. All right, so we'll enlarge the screen. Okay, so we are what we eat. Why law matters? As rightly mentioned by Mrs. Sangita, we usually eat what we want, but we do not really know what we are eating and what is in there. And the reason why this research was done is actually to enable most of our uh, students and well, as well as children here, either in this country or in Indonesia, to be able to understand why the law matters in what we are eating. So in today's presentation, there'll be five parts to this particular topic. First, the introduction, followed by the literature review of the overall framework, and what is the research paradigm that has been used in this particular project, what are the methods and the design, as well as some of the concerns, and followed by some of the results and discussions. And I will conclude with some of the recommendations. So as you can see here, the motivation of this study is actually from this particular famous saying, tell me what you eat and I will tell you what you are. So as you can see here, in this particular picture, some of you who are cheese lover will know who this uh, person is, his name is John Antlambri Lassavakong, and he also actually is a lawyer himself back in the early 19th century, and he wrote a very interesting book about the philosophy of uh, taste. So in this particular uh, perspective, he says that we are actually what we eat. So if we eat something healthy, of course, something healthy will happen to us. But if we put junk in our body, we will end up being literally junks as well. But in reality, do we really know what we eat? Me, generally, before I actually uh, dive myself into this topic, I just eat whatever that I like. That's the thing. What I like may not be good for me. So that's why how I started this particular topic, which I think is interesting. Okay, so this is the famous diagram. As you can see here in ASEAN, the obesity rate is increasing. As you can see here, Malaysia is the champion in obesity and we are not so proud of it. Obviously, this statistics was given in 2019 and it has not taken into account of the COVID-19 situation here where everyone has been controlled of their movement. I believe the same for Indonesia, some regions and most of the regions, we are not allowed to go out and we have to stay at home. So this 44.2% obesity in the current 2021 statistic, it might have already increased by 5%. So Malaysia will still be the champion in obesity, but of course not forgetting about Indonesia. As you can see here, the statistics here for adults, 21% of adults are obese. So one fifth of Indonesian population is obese or overweight. So what is our problem here in Malaysia and Indonesia and countries in between, such as Thailand, such as Singapore? What's wrong with us? The problem is one of the problems that we do not really bother on what we are eating, or we choose not to bother what we are eating. Before we know, as you can see here in Malaysia itself, within the past 10, 15 years, there is a steady increase of obesity and overweight categories. So currently I believe that most of you are aged 
between 18 to 29. So as you can see here, between 2006 and 2015, there is a steady increase of overweight percentage in Malaysia of this age group between in uh, 2006, 26%, and it jumped about, about 8% in 10 years to 34.8, and is always increasing, and it seems to be unstoppable. So what can law do to help to stop or reverse this trend? And why is it that law that is important? I'm not talking about laws that, such as in Japan, if some of you may be aware of, they have actually introduced a very drastic law. We're not talking about capital punishment for obese people, of course, no, that's too extreme. But we are talking about a law known as the Metabol Law, where employees must go through health checkup to measure their waistline, meaning that they have to comply with a certain threshold in order to continue their work if they do not comply with the threshold of the measurement of the waistline, the employers will have to let them go through certain treatment in order to reduce their BMI or the body mass index in terms of their issue. So it's by law that in Japan, they need to go through this particular measurement or health checkup every year for the employees age 40 and above. So luckily we have not got come to that stage yet, but what can we do about it? So we know that obviously uh, obese or overweight human beings do not poof up overnight. They are not balloons that we just blow them up overnight. They become from 40 kilos to 120 kilos. It's a vicious cycle. So as you can see here, the vicious cycle starts not when they are uh, 18 years old, but start when they are already perhaps three years old. So once that habit of not exercising, once the habit of eating food, whatever they want, and whenever they want starts, then it becomes rather unstoppable. So by the time they reach the age of 18, or even 20 years old, just like majority of us here. I mean, not myself, I'm already more than 40, but the younger generation here, I know that most of us like to uh, watch movie. Most of us like to play video games. Most of us like to um, binge on some food when we are watching movie. It's acceptable as long as it's not done in excessive manner. But this is actually the background why law matters. Especially now we are talking about the intake of food and what is in the food itself. So as you can see here, adolescents are defined as a population age between five to 19 years old. So in this country in Malaysia, out of the half population who are overweight or obese, about one fifth are actually adolescents. This is worrying. This is worrying because adolescents, they will grow up to be adults and into adulthood, when they become obese, they become overweight. What will be the medical bills to be foot by the state in order to overcome their problem? So we are talking about budgeting for health issues. Already we have COVID-19 issue here all over the world in a global manner. In addition, also during the COVID, there are studies already um, confirmed that population with obese or overweight issues are more likely to be at risk of fatal um, mortality rates. It actually correlates between obesity and correlation of risk of death in case of COVID-19. And this is something that law needs to do now. It could have been done earlier, but it has not been done earlier, but it has to be done now in order to reverse this trend. 
all right? So I believe that this is not only a national issue, but it's an, an international issue involving all the countries in this particular region and also beyond. So as you can see here, childhood obesity is on the rise. Childhood meaning that for both age between five to um, 18 to 19 years old. And we need to have proper legal mechanisms to implement to overcome this serious public health problem. And one of the ways to mold informed individual choice and to shape individual choice is through the use of school environment. This is one of the ways. It's not the only way, but one of the possible and most visible ways. So four research questions which are relevant to this particular project is on the effectiveness, first of all, on the proposed regulatory regime in promoting healthy diet using menu labeling. And why is it that we are justified to use this menu labeling legislation. Is it because we have nothing else better to do or we just want to impose more financial burden on the food service companies for them to be in compliance? No, it's not, but it's more for public health concerns. And also we'll be also exploring to what extent does self-regulation by school cafeterias facilitate health diet among adolescents? And most importantly, how to formulate a legal framework of menu labeling regulation, which would facilitate healthy diet among adolescents in schools and beyond. And the objectives which are to be achieved is to determine the potential defectiveness of proposed menu labeling and to analyze the legal justifications in international as well as national laws. And moving on uh, to propose a framework to increase the use of menu labeling information among adolescents in Malaysia and also beyond to promote a healthy diet. So three research methods which are qualitative are used in order to achieve these research objectives. First of all, through the use of critical analysis of legal text and also eight focus groups with the adolescents or teenagers themselves to understand from their perspective, what will be the ideal framework for them to comply or they are more keen to comply with. And also three in situ interviews. This was actually done prior to the pandemic. So I was uh, able to meet these professionals and also these adolescents in person and face-to-face. -face. So the originality of the study is to fill in the gap in justification of law and many labeling regulation, and also to enable policymakers to devise a better menu labeling system to improve the diet of the young people and the young adults and to employ world adolescents to devise a better menu labeling framework to increase a healthy diet among the younger populations. So the scope of this particular study is consists of a small sample size. There are a total of about 24 adolescents which are involved in this particular study. And all of them are living in the Selangor state, which is one of the most uh, economically <clears throat> developed states. So they are more prone to eat outside and also they are more prone to eat in fast food chains, such as in the McDonald's or in the KFC, so on and so forth, Pizza Hut. So the legislations that were selected is based on direct impact of the public consumer health through the use of food regulations. So some other regulations such as the use of tax, the use of um, uh, public uh, planning architecture regulations are not taken into account, but that will be good scope that we will expand in the near future. So as you can see here, the overview of menu nutrition labeling is actually 
based on the Codex guideline on nutrition labeling. Codex is the um, food code that is to be complied with by countries, including uh, most of developed countries and also Indonesia, as well as Malaysia and most of the Southeast Asian countries. So these menu labeling regulation has been recommended to be gazetted in the national plan and it should be able, but we are not sure yet because currently it's being debated the usefulness of this particular legislation. So it is actually a type of food label that lists down the nutritional information on the food menus, especially for takeaway food. I believe that during this particular pandemic, all of us, or most of us, in addition to home cooked food, we also have takeaway foods through such as uh, food uh, delivery platforms. I believe that Indonesia in Samara also you have Panda Food Service that actually we can order online. So the aim of this legislation is to enable the consumers to see what is the nutritional uh, information that is on their plate. For instance, their, in their nasi, uh, lemma, or also the rendang beef, what is inside? What is the protein level? What is the uh, carbohydrate level, sugar? Currently, we do not have that information because it's not actually imposed by the law, all right? So in accordance with section two of the Food Act 1983 in Malaysia, nutrition labeling or food labels include any tag, brand, mark, pictorial or other descriptive matters, written, printed or stencil, marked, painted, embossed, or impressed on or attached to or included or belonging to accompanying any food. So one of the ways that we can see is through the display of calories on the food that is to be taken at the food outlet. For instance, some examples here are medium pepperoni pizza, uh, pizza 210 calories. And currently we do not have that information in Malaysia yet. I believe that most of the ASEAN countries, we do not have mandatory food uh, menu labeling in restaurants. Some restaurants do have voluntary basis of using it, but it's not common here in this country, unfortunately. And uh, that's the reason why there is a need for the law to intervene in order to have those information for consumers, especially younger adults, to know what they are eating actually. So some of the reviews of the literature supports that menu labeling can actually reduce calorific energy ordered and consumed, specifically for away from home food or some food that are being um, ordered online, all right? However, there are some inconsistent effectiveness in different regions. Some regions such as um, in most of the developed countries, uh, for instance, in uh, Japan and also in uh, Denmark seems to be effective, but not all the other countries, right? So we have to find out also the reason why, although the law has been imposed, but people are actually not bothered about it. So as you can see here, there is a good possibility that menu labeling is a potential legal tool for public health. And as mentioned also by Mrs. Angita, public health law research is a very new study of legal research in Malaysia. I believe also in Indonesia is a very new area. And public health law research is not only the law that is confined to the law of the books, but it also covers both state and non-state regulatory techniques and how law operates as a social practice. So it can involve both voluntary and mandatory uh, regulations as well as some of the policies and measures. So there is a gap in the literature review of this particular area of law and that's the reason why this project can actually assist in filling up this particular gap. And also we know that some of the perceptions of adult consumers have been studied, but not 
for the adolescents. So for adult consumers, uh, generally they do care to a certain extent as parents. So I believe that most of the faculty members who are parents, they do care about what the children are taking. But generally, there are no statistics or studies showing what adolescents think about all this particular nutritional information. So as you can see here, some studies previously studied upon adult consumers in Shah Alam in Selangor found positively perception of this icon-based nutrition labels. So some of the ways could be effective as long as there is actually active awareness of the adult consumers. Unfortunately, the adolescents view have not been studied and this particular project actually gathered some of the views from adolescents, how they perceive these particular nutrition labels. So, of course, we know that uh, Hari Raya has just uh, been celebrated by most of our friends. Here. Obviously, during Hari Raya, this particular menu labeling will be less effective because during festive seasons, we tend to indulge, we tend to forget a little bit for about maybe two or three days about healthy diet. This is acceptable because we are not living in the a regimented region where we are rationed of what we are eating. So it is totally acceptable for festive season to indulge, but as long as it is not done in excessive manner. So as such, there is a good potential also in using healthy label certification as a way to increase the availability and awareness of healthy meals especially in worksite canteens or cafeterias for staff in a particular educational institution. And from the perspective of restaurateurs and food service providers, generally they're extremely supportive, but not due to that uh, they are uh, happy to do it, but because some of the owners themselves are conscious about it. For those who are unable to do it, this is due to the cost issues, for instance, cost in preserving or keeping uh, food fresher for a longer time is costly. And also they need uh, support from the, uh, the de device of nutritionists or dietitians in order to list down all the nutritional information of each single item in the menu. This is also another cost to be taken into account. So these are some of the obstacles, but some of the potentials from the perspective of the food service providers. So on another way that can actually encourage corporations in order to use uh, healthy uh, food labels is through the image of corporate social responsibility. So one of the studies also in South Korea shows that the relationship of uh, menu labeling as a form of corporate social responsibility initiative could actually provide the practitioners with effective strategies to enhance customer loyalty and also enable them to be able to be more proactive in supporting the menu labeling regulation. This is especially important during the COVID-19 situation where most or a lot of the consumers are actually ordering food online away from home. This will be some point in order for the food service providers to think about to promote the image of corporate social responsibilities. So as you can see here, through this particular project, uh, some of the legislations have been properly, uh, systematically, as well as organized and presented. And the utilization of law, again, has been supported by researchers and non-governmental organizations in order to promote healthy diet, especially among the adolescents. So some of the legal justifications based on international law, as you can see here, where Malaysia is one of the signatories on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So as you can see here, in Article 3, best interest of the child 
is actually one of the key articles in order for the menu regulation to include food labeling in order for them to make an informed choice for the sake of their health, all right? So I believe Indonesia also is one of the uh, signatory of this particular convention on the rights of the child. Subsequently, another article which is relevant on the legal justification of the menu labeling is based on Article 6 of the right to life. When we talk about life, we are not talking about survival, but survival with quality and with proper provision of healthy and nutritional food, which is in line also with Article 24 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child on right to good quality health care, clean water, nutritious food, and clean environment. And also moving on, we also would like them to express their views in accordance with Article 12 on the Convention on the Rights of the Child on how they can actually further improve the regulation on the menu labeling to be utilized either in uh, general restaurants or some uh, hotels, so on and so forth. So these are some of the ways or even fast food restaurants. It's important to hear from them what they would be bothered to look at or not. And then moving on also Article 13 is important for them to share information as long as it's not damaging. And also Article 27 where the right of children to have a standard of living adequate for their physical, mental, spiritual, moral, and social development, specifically with regard to nutrition, clothing, as well as housing. So these are some of the proper justifications in order for menu labeling to be uh, recommended and gazetted based on the International Treaty on the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Moving on, another type of international law that could be used or has been used to justify it is through the use of Codex Alimentarius. So as most of us are aware of, this is actually an international law specifically on regulation of food, where Article 1A specifically states that the Codex Alimentarius Commission shall be responsible for making proposal for the purpose, which is protecting the health of the consumer and ensuring fair practices in the food trade specifically. Obviously, this includes also the justification of protecting the health of the consumer through the provision of menu labeling legislation by providing information, nutritional information to the consumers for them to make an informed choice. Moving on to the national laws, as you can see here, there are several national laws which are suitable and useful in the justification. First of all, is the Federal Constitution of 1957, accordance with section or Article 5 of the Rights to Life, as well as to Liberty. Again, Right to Life requires a liberal interpretation in which life refers not only to the uh, survival, but also to the good quality of life that is actually in the best interest of all the residents and people living in this particular country. And also in accordance with Food Act 1985, where multiple sections dealing with food safety and labeling and to include possible amendments for manual labeling as part of the major amendments and in relation to consumers between Contracts Act 1950 as well as Sale of Goods Act 1957, which both are actually relevant to relationship between business to business as well as business to consumers, either online or in person. Most importantly, Consumer Protection Act 1999 will surely ensure that this particular menu labeling will be one of the tools in order to enhance the consumer protection in this particular country. So as you can see here, ways to improve menu labeling regulation 
is actually through the use one of the best ways participatory research as well as the notion of youth empowerment. So participatory research is useful in order for community to be able to encourage awareness among them and to through the use of awareness and encouragement, they will be more likely to comply with this particular regulation to promote its effectiveness. And also it's useful to explore what are the potential issues which are stopping food service operators from uh, implementing or complying with the menu labeling regulations. So the research paradigms that are used are actually multiple. First of all, with the constructivism, uh, where the statements and also the views of the participants are actively constructed in order to be incorporated in the solution and recommendation, and critical theory in which not only the literal interpretation of this particular study is used, but also to analyze what is behind and the reason of some of the participants. And also most importantly, to get involved the communities who will be using or likely to be using this particular uh, regulations. So as you can see here, in order to uh, achieve research objective of determining the potential effectiveness of the manual labeling regulation in the upcoming years, the paradigms which are used include participatory and constructivism. And the methodology that it is used is through the use of focus group, where uh, adolescents are gathered together to have a discussion and to talk about some of the ways how and why they don't like it or they like to use of this particular manual labeling. Moving on, as you can see here, these are the focus groups that have been conducted uh, in, uh, prior to the COVID-19. So uh, I have deliberately uh, used this particular image because uh, this is in compliance with research ethics where minors' identity are to remain anonymized. So um, these pictures actually are taken, but uh, I actually uh, make sure that the faces are not visible in order to comply with the research ethics, which were actually provided in this particular research by the university. So based on these uh, focus groups, some of the outcomes and discussions were quite interesting because they also proposed some great ideas on how the lawmakers could do or what they could actually improve in order to assist the effectiveness of many labeling regulations. And moving on in order to uh, achieve research objective too. So critical theory that is used in which legal interpretation uh, using not only literature, uh, literal interpretation, but also other forms of uh, interpretations are used. And as you can see here, the text that were actually used were the federal constitution, as well as the uh, international laws of codex and also the relevant statutes, as well as the convention on the rights of the child. And moving on in order to achieve research objective three, the self-regulation of the school cafeteria uh, has been achieved through the use of in-situ interviews with the service providers and also the use of critical theory. So as you can see here, not only the cafeteria, but also Ministry of Health dietitians have uh, provided their input during these interviews in order to enable the researcher in this particular project to understand why this particular menu labeling is useful or to what extent it can be useful and how it can actually be improved to enhance its effectiveness. So moving on in order to research, uh, to achieve research objective four is to enable a framework to be proposed to increase the use of manual labeling 
to the use of constructivism and these methodologies in the use of focus groups, institute interviews, and legal texts are holistically uh, analyzed and synergized in order to achieve this particular recommendation of framework to be used. So why, you must be asking me, why should I be bothered to ask the adolescents what's their view? The reason being that if we do not ask the users what they think about a particular legislation, it's hard for us to see from their perspective why this law can be useful. Of course, on a piece of paper, it may look perfect to the legislator, but if I'm the user of this law, maybe I can see that, well, the law that we are proposing is not really suitable for some reasons. For instance, if I propose a manual labeling that says that you must write down from A to Z, how many percentage of carbohydrate, how many percentage, and the user will say, well, who's gonna have the time to go and read those information? I'm starving, I just want to eat. Who is gonna help me to read those things? You know, I have maybe like half an hour a break or interval from my class and all I need is just to grab something quickly and move on to another class. So it's important to gather the views of the users, how this menu labeling could be displayed in order to enhance its utility. And also during the age of adolescence, it's important for them to articulate and provide their views on what is the best for themselves. Okay, so this is a stage where it's crucial where we inculcate these habits also. So that's the reason why focus group was actually chosen. So some of the challenges that were encountered actually include the institutional human ethics approval, because to have uh, minors who are under the age of 18 involved as a participant, in this particular institution in Taylor's, all the research involving minors must go through the institutional human ethics approval. So this uh, committee will actually read and also propose some of the ways that this particular research can be done in order not to jeopardize the interest of the adolescents. So these are some of the challenges, but was successfully overcome. And secondly, some parents were actually negating the consent of their children to be involved because they think that uh, maybe they need more time to focus on their academic studies instead of being involved in research relating to law. So this is the typical Asian mentality where academic comes more important to public health. This is amazing, but this is the reality that we have encountered. And also some challenge include the promising of anonymity and confidentiality to the minors and their parents, which we have so far successfully uh, maintained. And also fourth is the cost in professional video recording equipment, where actually uh, my colleague actually assist me to record the focus group discussions in live. And uh, some of the equipment can be costly because uh, it can actually go up to uh, five, six thousand ringgit, just uh, in order for them to purchase those equipment. But luckily we have the support from the institution. So moving on, the results actually from the perspective of the cafeteria is actually quite encouraging because currently they are using some soft measures to promote healthy diet and there are some self-regulations in place. Unfortunately, there are also some challenges that they have faced in which their own staff may be less familiar with the nutritional information themselves and maybe not all the staff are well-trained, okay? And also there are some lack of habitual utility of reading of the labels by the adolescents themselves. And also from the perspective of the Ministry of Health dietitians, it is, very, very um, challenging for some of them to monitor the kitchen stuff. And also most importantly in this particular country, there is a severe shortage of registered dietitians who are well qualified 
in order to devise a proper menu specifically catered for the needs of adolescents. And also some of the challenges include the increase of self-monitoring of adolescents and also food literacy levels of adolescents in which unfortunately not a um, majority of them are actually well equipped in food literacy. So some of the results also show some interesting perspective of the adolescents. So through the use of the Google form, we know that this one happened in 2019. So already about half of the participants says that they, between one to five days per month, they do buy food from outside of fast food. So we haven't run another session post COVID-19, but surely the percentage of outside food could have increased further due to takeaways or online orders or orders through the app, right? And also frequency of fast food purchases were actually more than half, all right? At least two days per week. So it shows how important it is for the consumers to be able to read what is in their food, for them to be able to have a healthy diet and in turn to have healthy body. Moving on, the, although they do read the food labels, as you can see here, about 40.9% of them never read food labels and 45.5% of them actually never even uh, base their decision of purchase using caloric or nutritional information. This is alarming and this has to be uh, properly addressed. So of course, obviously, taste and cost are the two important food choices considerations. Just like many of us, cost is one factor because we receive some pocket monies from parents or adolescents and they have to budget accordingly. But also taste is one of the consideration, sugary, salty, yummy food comes first at a compromise of other considerations. So moving on also, as you can see here, this is a simple question where how many calories does school student of his age and gender need? The correct answer that is being answered, only 9.1% that is less than 10% of the participants got it right. So there is a strong need to increase the food literacy level in this country in order to have the effectiveness of many labeling regulations to be enhanced. Because if we have the regulation, but not most of them are aware of how to use it, then it will mean that the whole exercise could be futile. And we know that although they do notice food labeling, but unfortunately, 86.4% actually never used those food labeling. From what I was um, made known of, they do know it, but they don't generally bother about. Is it because of the font size? It could be. Is it because of the peer pressure? It could be. So the reason why we need to gather their view is that we need to know why what is stopping them from utilizing those information that could be useful? So as you can see here, first obstacle is on the information asymmetry in the menu labels. Most of them are unaware or confused of what the information is, and they are not sure if the claims are really true. So this is one of the challenges that needs to be addressed in recommending a proper menu labeling regulation in order for the food service providers to provide accurate information by qualified dietitians, which is severely lacking in this country. And also some ways to enhance is that labels should be given and labels also should be encouraged through self-awareness of peers and adolescents could actually be the champions in organizing public campaigns. And also there is a need to 
increase the awareness of parents and guardians in order for them to make full use of this proposed menu labeling regulations. And some of the ideas proposed is that these uh, menu labels could be color coded for the ease of reference. It could, should be simplified and easier for a persons of the age to understand and utilize quickly. It should be engaging and mobile apps and social networks could be useful. One of the suggestions was that whenever there is an online order, all the information could pop up in color-coded um, manner. For instance, if it is red, it means that high sugar, high salty level, so on and so forth. And also, I was actually informed in Italy already, there are some uh, food service providers who pre-order food using those mechanisms, which are already running very well, especially during the COVID-19 situation. So moving on towards the end, uh, also we know that the legal justifications are very clear using international laws, such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Codex Elementarius, as well as the national law is clear on federal constitution 1957, Food Act 1985, Contracts Act 1950, Consumer Protection Act 1999, as well as Sale of Goods Act 1957. So some of the obstacles faced by the cafeteria include the lack of role models by the guardians at home, lack of nutritionists, as well as staff in monitoring of the healthy diet, compliance, and inadequacy of the cafeteria operators, as well as some of the school management, as most importantly, operational cost to the canteen operators in order to implement this particular regulation. So what are the potential solutions? First of all, let the adolescents be the agents of healthful change. So let the adolescents lead the way through the leading of the ways. They are more able to comply and they are more able to be involved in this particular uh, important change. There is also a need to increase the number of qualified nutritionists as well as dietitians. And also we know that some of the operators are not familiar with English. And as such, there is a need to train them using their own mother tongues. So also multilingual means of uh, reinforcing knowledge is crucial. And also there is a need to have a proper uh, school feeding program, possibly through homegrown, uh, program of uh, by reducing operational cost. So as you can see here, the conclusion is that will the proposed regulation regime be effective? The answer is a yes, but there is a need to increase labels and to increase self-awareness and increase public campaigns and guardians, parents influence. And the legal justifications are very clear as we have mentioned earlier on, through international and also national laws. And also what about the view of the cafeteria? Yes, there is a strong spirit of self-regulation, but there is a need to increase the health literacy of the adults and to rectify the habits of the kitchen staff. There is also a need to reduce the direct and indirect cost that is to be involved in implementing this menu lately. And what is the way to formulate a proper framework? Three dimensions must be involved through the use of adolescents in their active involvement and through government in subsidizing or tax incentives for implementation of menu labeling and also to the cooperation promotion of corporate social responsibilities. So this particular research, as you can see, provides practical dimension by empowering adolescents, filling the gaps in the legal justifications, and also enable policymakers to devise a better system 
and enables business business to have a proper strategy to the use of corporate social responsibility. And the theoretical contribution is to enhance the critical youth empowerment theory, as well as the participatory research. So some of the recommendation is actually to analyze other relevant legislations in addition to many labeling to create positive incentives to promote a healthy diet, for instance, the sugar tax or obesity tax or fat tax. And also it's uh, useful to have another study to compare the pre and post behavioral change before and after the implementation of menu labeling regulations in 2025, which is four years from now, and a detailed cost benefit impact analysis of the menu labeling regulations on the restaurants and also the food service providers. With that, I end the presentation of this particular topic on why law matters in what we eat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sia Tintin, for the interesting lecture. Yes. And right now, I would like to open the question and answer sessions. Yes. Uh, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps if you have any questions for our guest lecturer, you may ask directly by pressing the menu bar in uh, press, uh, sorry raise hand button and then perhaps you can write down uh, the your questions in chat column right now okay uh, right now we have already one questions in the chat column meanwhile we are waiting for the others to deliver their questions from miss resty mm -hmm. uh, i will read this Questions for you, Doctor. Thank Does the new labeling really effective from any state practices? Since I believe that not all society have the same capability within nutritional, nutritional education. Hence, despite there is many labeling, isn't this just pressing company but letting the individuals to choose in the end of the day? Wasn't it better to create a law limiting people's instead? of good despite there is violations of human rights there but there will be greater benefit which is to create a better public health situation that's question doctor the time is yours yeah that's a very good question from Resti Sutraini I love this question because it leaves us uh, in a dilemma either we push people to be thin or we let them do what they want. So there is a balance that needs to be seek, to be sought in this situation. So I can see that it's correct that uh, not all society have the same capability of nutritional education. And the reason why we give the information is actually, especially using simplified manners, not only uh, in one mono language, but different languages. This is to enable them to have an informed choice. So the reason is that once they're informed, we leave it to them to decide if they want to choose what they want and bear the consequences of it, or they would rethink what their choice is once they're given that information. I know that, yes, uh, you say that correctly, that uh, just to limit the food intake of the people, but this is a very difficult task. How do we measure the needs of every single individual? The most of it is we can give a general guideline, but we cannot say that, okay, now Miss Cha Chin Chin, today you eat only 1,200 calories of food. If you exceed that, you will be punished. From that perspective, it is first of all, not very practical because it will be more costly to monitor and to impose a penalty mechanism. Imagine the population in this country, how many, 31 million people? And also in Indonesia, what is the current population, uh, Mrs. Angita, approximately? Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, tw tw twice than Malaysia maybe. <laughs> yes, so 
I think if that uh, uh, particular legislation to limit the individual's uh, food intake is implemented, it is on the paper very useful, but in practice, it is hard. It's harder to implement and it's more costly. So it's a very, very uh, uh, impossible to uh, implement it in criminal uh, frameworks, right? It's possible, yeah, it's possible, but it's unfortunately, again, a, a form of violation as well. Yes, it, it's included as violence, right? Uh, if we uh, promote or uh, make regulations in uh, criminal or penalty frameworks regulatory. Mm. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for the answer. Uh, okay, from Resty, it's 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 already enough. Okay, there's another question from Resty. However, will it possible for us to implement the law applied in Japan to our country, or was it too hard for the company and boost the food supply chains to follow? That's questions. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think the companies, if first of all, they are aware their responsibility as a corporate. Uh, in their social responsibility to the society, I think it's trending now. And if the owners are actually uh, believing in the notion of corporate social responsibility, they are more likely to um, adopt this approach, especially uh, currently in Malaysia, we have this um, uh, corporate governance framework where bigger corporations are encouraged to uh, portray the image in the corporate social uh, responsibility regime. So that is one of the ways that could actually encourage them to do so. I believe that in Indonesia, also corporate governance is uh, one of the major reforms, I believe, correct? Yes, uh, many mm. of uh, their projects uh, enhance mm. all of the uh, information and then the mm. practices of the food regulatory, like what mm. you said before. Mm -mm. Yeah, so I think that will be uh, useful for the corporation because they will portray their image in that sense. Mm. Mm -mm. Yes. Yes. Uh, to to give information and provide uh, the facilitations, of course. <laughs> okay. Mm. Uh, is there any questions from the participants? We are. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, Resty, is is it enough for you? Or perhaps is there any questions from you? Okay. Uh, okay. That really answered, Doctor. Thank you from Resty. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, regarding your uh, school in Europe and then your research regarding food law, uh, perhaps uh, what recommendations that should be uh, provided by the, uh, the legislator in Malaysia to make uh, new regulations that has been exist right now. Perhaps there is another regulation that be needed by the Malaysian government. Is there any recommendation mm. from you? So it's on the amendment of the Food Act itself, because currently we have the Food Act 1983, but some of the legislations are not updated. So there is a need to uh, enhance, but including the menu labeling, specifically for the fast food chains, as well as uh, away from home meals, especially now we are in the COVID-19 situations where a lot of our teenagers, they are not, uh, cooking at home, but they are actually ordering food online. Mm -hmm. So surely there is a need for them to be informed what is in there that they are eating. Because mm -hmm. most of the teenagers, they just click on the picture, what mm -hmm. appeals to the eye and what appeals to the tummy. Yes. Uh, yes, I mean. that's correct. <laughs> this already <laughs> happened, you know. Yes. Uh, when we are watching, we been watching in Korean drama. We are eating a lot of many snacks, like what we have watched in the drama, like ramen yes. and the yes. tteokbokki, yeah. kimchi. Yes. But yes. we are not less considered about the nutrition effect on the this food. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, doctor. There is another question from Mr. Radit. What mm -hmm. is the ideal 
form of healthy food labeling policy by balancing various interests in society. Because we know that the majority of developing countries have not dared to be to strict in emphasizing this policy for fear of disrupting the business climate, especially small, medium enterprises. Yeah, that's the question from mm. Mr. Rohandi. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Rohandi, for a very, very uh, good question again. So it's happening here in the sense that most of the bigger corporations, they have the financial means and they have the resources to implement. What about the small and medium enterprises? They are the ones struggling the most, especially during the COVID-19 situation. So I think one possible ways is for private sectors, such as the bigger corporations, to be able to assist or support them using their expertise, the current expertise that they have, or the state with their current expertise. For instance, if to be able to devise the menu labeling, we need to employ a nutritionist and that will cost money. But what if the uh, service is provided voluntarily by the nutritionists themselves or from bigger corporations that they are willing to share the resources? There'll be one way to support the small and medium enterprises also. So through the use of um, pooling the expertise from bigger corporations. So this will require the community of dietitians in order for them to assist for a proper um, implementation. It's not easy, but it has to start from somewhere. And it has to either start from the bigger corporations or a joint effort from the bigger corporations and the government also. Okay, for all of the stakeholders should develop uh, uh, the, the, the sporting uh, system like that, to yeah. build, uh, like uh, mm -hmm. nutritionist uh, peop, uh, groups mm -hmm. to, to promote the, the mindset. Okay, yes. uh, and then the, another question from Ephrema. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm Ephrema. You mentioned about educating students, adolescents, etc. But today on social media, there's influencers who have a big platform promoting the idea of body positivity or healthy at every size, which mm. is obviously not true. Mm. My question is more on the societal perspective. How do we change this mindset? if we start with the young generation, it will take whole generation to fix the mindset. How do, you, how do we speed up the process? Thank you, from the Ephraim. Thank you for asking this question, Ephraim. The fact that on social media, there is the influencer that you identified as giving the wrong information, you should write to this influencer and tell them, look, you are wrong and make sure that the community knows that they are promoting the wrong information. It starts from ourselves. First, as you can see here, to change the society, it doesn't start from anybody around us, but it starts from ourselves. And also, if you notice that some people, these influencers, they are giving wrong information, stand up and tell them politely and say that you are wrong and Please correct it. I think that will be one way of starting from ourselves. So we have to stick on the BMI indications measurement for to make sure is it uh, proper to have a size like this or not? Is it? Mm -hmm. a, uh, yes, but of course we don't want to discriminate people who are obese yes, due to health issues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, I do uh, not say that this uh, is the right uh, way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we, uh, the if 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 we say that the opportunity is bad, so we have to say that bad. We have to bold of of these matters, right? Mm, yes. Okay. There's no question. I hope about, that answers your question. Uh, how or... about you, Ephrema? Is it enough for you, Ephrema? Okay. Uh, there is question from Raisa Zandra. Hello, I am Raisa. 
Okay, for Ephrema, thank you very much. Yeah, she is our international undergraduate program students. Okay, uh, thank you. Right now, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, right now, she is in the second years. I in see. Faculty Excellent. of Law in BIP. Uh, yeah. Hello, I am Raisa. Previously, you have mentioned that public campaigns by the adolescents is important in promoting healthy diet with the rise of low idea of fat positivity in your opinion. Does the body positivity uh, movement contributes in the rise of obesity in younger demographic? Okay, that's a very good question. And it is a question that I would like to have the answer as well. Because currently we do not have statistics yet. Yeah. Based on my estimation, it could, but we need to be uh, sure of it through the use of statistics. So if one of you or some of you can take the initiative and make a poll for a duration of perhaps six months from the movement commencement of this body positivity movement and then see if there is a change in behavior, that will be very useful for us to study whether it does or it does not actually change. I hope that answers your question. That's a very good question, Raisa. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raisa. Is, is it enough for you or you have another questions or maybe opinion? Or perhaps for another participants, if you have uh, questions, you, you may ask directly. Uh, you can uh, unmute your microphone and speak up directly with, with your guest lecturer. Is there yeah. a question from you? Maybe uh, you can uh, have the reaction uh, hands up and uh, yeah, you can actually ask directly, mm. no problem. Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah, press. Don't be hesitant to press the buttons. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, no uh, problem. Uh, okay. Uh, There's one there. question I saw also from uh, Resti regarding the implementation of law in Japan to our own country. Uh, uh, it's already you, you have answered. I already that. answered that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, I think that's enough for today, Doctor. Oh, she Raisa has said thank you, Doctor. Uh -uh. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, I think that's all for today, uh, doctor. Let's yeah, continue. sure, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, Mrs. Ankita, maybe uh, I can't really hear you. So sorry, sorry about I, I, I'm. <laughs> I forgot ah, to okay. unmute. Okay, sure. uh, dear participants, uh, don't forget to fill in the registrations form in the Google uh, Google link that will be shared by the committees uh, soon in the chat column. Okay, uh, I think that's enough for today, uh, ladies okay. and gentlemen. And Finally, we come to the end of this general lecture. And before I close the forum, this lecture, I would like to read a brief conclusions. Our general lecture topic is inspired by Jean Antel Brihlet Saferin, quotes that we are what we eat. He is the author of Vigility of the Taste, a French lawyer and politician. The obesity rate is increasing exponentially, uh, especially during this pandemic COVID-19 outbreaks caused by bad eating habits that contribute to weight gain and the restricted and limitations mobility of human. So it is very necessary to government to take a part to propose a regulation regarding menu labeling. Now the problem is there is a gap in the literature in the analysis of legal justification for food labeling, including menu labeling to promote healthy diets. Uh, many countries in Southeast Asia, such as Malaysia and of course Indonesia too, have a minimum research literacy regarding these matters, especially regarding the risk of adolescence. And meanwhile, we have signed the Convention on the Rights of the Child, both of our countries, Malaysia and Indonesia, have signed it too. And one of the rights in this confidence is to guarantee the right of the 
good quality health care, clean water, especially nutritious food and clean. And we have uh, considered it too in the 17 point of SDGs in the second point is uh, zero hunger too. And uh, so the government has to make an effort to provide the relating regulation and improve the legal scientific research regarding adolescent and also upgrade and push the increasing registration menu labeling for local foods. And also our guest lecturer uh, promote some recommendations regarding the further research that have to be conducted by the scientifics. Uh, first, analysis of an other relevant registration to create positive incentives to promote a healthy diet. And second, uh, a detailed cost benefit and impact analysis of the proposed menu labeling regulations upon restorators. And then the third one is a study to compare pre and post behavior change before and after the implementation of menu labeling regulations in 2025. Okay, uh, that's all for the <clears throat> oh, my sorry, my brief conclusions. And once again, I would like to say thank you very much for our guest lecturer, Dr. Sia Chin Chin, for her informative and interesting lecture. It's very honor for us to receive a lecture from you, and then to continue uh, the academic collaborations with Taylor's University. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanjita, and everyone uh, that are currently present. Thank you. Thank you. And I will not forget to say thank you for all the participants for your active participation. And hopefully the presentation will be beneficial for everybody. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you stay healthy and stay safe in these unprecedented times. Good, uh, good morning. And now I would like to return the floor for the Master of Ceremony, Ms. Presti. The time is yours. Thank you, Ms. Angita, and also Dr. Sia Chin Chin for the amazing presentations and the amazing lectures. Um, thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will hold a photo session before uh, we really end and close this session. So please uh, turn on your camera so that I can... Uh, so therefore, I can count on one, two, three, and then take your pictures together. All right, so yeah, please turn on your camera now, everyone, because it's also, will be recorded and you go live stream. <laughs> All right. Yeah, uh, I'm waiting for 10 seconds for everyone to turn on your camera. After that, I'm gonna, Take the pictures accordingly. Okay, so up your face. I know you have a good face, beautiful and handsome face. So you, you should show up your face because you are watched in the YouTube right now. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we are waiting for you. <laughs> Everyone be shying away if they were to, to turn on their camera. It's like they're gonna do, they're gonna be inspected from the nutritionist. <laughs> you, you are the nutritionist agents in the <laughs> university. They're gonna be inspected. Mm -hmm. so, let's do it. Turn on their camera. All right, everyone. I'm seeing people are now turning on their camera. Well. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, you, you you have already a cute, handsome, and uh, beautiful face. Come on, show up. <laughs> <laughs> Be proud. Yeah, proud. And, Be yeah, proud give me the pleasure your, of uh, knowing you face to face as well. Yeah, at least uh, let Please. our guest selector to see your face. <laughs> All the way from Malaysia, I would like to see your beautiful, handsome faces. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, uh, I think they still touch up, yeah, for the preparation, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I can see you. I can see you touch up yeah, and make That's up. That's okay. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> Hi, guys. Please turn on your camera. Right now, Zoom had its unfiltered. I'm currently using their filter. <laughs>
or can using uh, TikTok filter maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the beauty of technology can beautify everyone. Yeah, yeah. the artificial intelligence is very helpful. <laughs> yes, definitely, yes. <laughs> Thanks to technology. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I saw no one turning on their camera any longer. Mm -mm. Then I'll take the picture uh, now on my count. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you can hear the screenshot. <laughs> now, the second part. One, two, three. Then, third part. One, two, three. And the last part would be, all right, one, two, three. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, it is the last sessions today. And thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your amazing time in this lecture. And also thank you to Dr. Sia Chin Chin and also thank you to uh, Mrs. Angita for the amazing uh, moderator that you have given to us. And we have finally come to the end of our session. And it has been a great, and wonderful after, uh, wonderful morning, or I can say now it's, a, it, oh, no, 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 it's still morning, not even 11 yet. All right, so thank you, so, thank you so much and for this wonderful morning with all of you. Thank you very much for your participation and attention. Good day, and this meeting will be ended by the host. You may leave the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sesinchin, and everybody. Thank and you very hope much. You will someday uh, to visit our city, Semarang. Yes, definitely. I hope I have the chance. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, thank you. Yes, more thank, welcome. You. Uh, thank, thank you, you Dr. Sesinchin. Thank yeah. you very uh, much, Rahandi. Uh, uh, okay. I wish uh, we can collaborate uh, on another project. Yeah, maybe. Yes, definitely. Yes, yes. You have my email and everything. So. Yes, yes. We'll definitely yeah, keep through in touch. Uh, EO staff, yeah, international organizations.